Welcome to our Dean Seminar Series. Um, and today I'm really delighted to present um, or introduce, I should say, Dr. Sarah Mamo, who um, obtained her doctoral degree um, in hearing science, um, as well as in audiology, um, as well as a Bachelor's of Arts in Communications from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We share the alma mater, um, both being two-time grads. Um, she then went on to complete a postdoctoral fellowship at John Hopkins School of Medicine and became a visiting um, clinical faculty and instructor there before she joined us in 2017. So she's a relatively new faculty member of us, ours, and we're delighted to have her here today. Her research focuses on the improving the accessibility and affordability of hearing healthcare for older adults. Her previous work investigated hearing loss associated with aging in various different populations. And her focus at UMass has been on developing interventions to test alternative service delivery models that focus on bringing hearing and communication support into the community and integrating those services into comprehensive healthcare programs for older adults. She has a particular interest in the area of dementia. Tonight, she's going to be talking about why age-related hearing loss matters in the grand scheme of public health. Sarah, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to um, join us for the De Dean Seminar Series. Thanks, and thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for coming on this most beautiful day. I am very sorry to all of you who are inside <laughs> to watch this stream right now, but hopefully there's at least a window in your periphery and you'll go outside after. Um, I will share my screen and I see, I, I wanted to have everybody's name up there so I could get a sense. I see there's at least five people who haven't heard at least parts of this spiel before. So that's good. <laughs> this is, this uh, um, will hopefully be fun for all of, all of you, but particularly folks that haven't heard these parts of my story before. So now my real challenge is looking into the camera instead of looking at myself, which is a weird, weird thing. Um, so I'll do my best. I moved myself off screen. <laughs> uh, so what I hope to share with you today is why age-related hearing loss matters to a person's health beyond that annoying um, family argument that happens every year at the Thanksgiving table. Um, and we'll start by saying that part of why it matters when I find how to click forward is that we have in the US and globally an aging population that is a huge public health priority. Um, and what happens as the dust of COVID settles, I don't know, but I don't, I think the scope of our aging population is and has been so huge that this will be a blip, but it's not going to change these overall projections um, that are just massive for our health system as a whole. And so a couple infographics that um, kind of put the aging population in context, and these just come from the U.S. Census Bureau, but on the one side, you see this sort of traditional uh, demonstration of age across a population. So we're going from the bottom of this pyramid, we have zero to four years old and up. And traditionally over time, we've seen this sort of pyramid structure to the age distribution across population. But what they're projecting moving forward is no longer a pyramid, but rather a pillar. Um, where we are extending life for so long that we, we no longer see a broader base of children. And on the second graph, you see that actually they're projecting in 2034, this teal line is adults over 65, and we see that exceeding the prevalence of children under 18. Those are the projections for the U.S. And I would argue that I don't think that's happened in the history of humankind. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a tribute to our good health systems that we are living this long, but it poses major hurdles for our public health and our, and our healthcare systems. And what we really want as people are aging and living longer is that it's happening in a healthy way, that it's not just prolonged um, 
life that doesn't have the health and independence that we all value. And so when we talk about healthy aging, that can be very abstract. And what, what is healthy aging? And, and this is the slide that my postdoc advisor always liked to start with. So I'm using, using it and channeling him. He always said, you know it when you see it. And so this gentleman, uh, I just checked because I was going to bring him up in this talk. He's 109. He's still alive. He started running marathons at the age of 89 and set all sorts of records during his 90s for completing major marathons, Toronto, New York. Um, and so that's clearly an extreme end of the healthy aging range, right? And the other end, and that we maybe think about more quickly is loss of mobility and um, loss of independence that leads to nursing home care. Then we see perhaps not an elite athlete in their 90s, but we see very healthy older adults who are busy in their community and helping care for grandchildren and um, active society members that are maintaining their health and lifestyle versus the other end of the challenge where there's dementia and loss of independence and loss of those positive connections, right? So we're all gonna be somewhere on this continuum and we're all looking for ways to really emphasize the healthier components of aging, right? Now, if I were a gerontologist, which I, I like to pretend I'm a little bit of, but I'm not trained as one, then you look at healthy aging and you put it into lots of different bins that we might study that matter in the context of age. So certainly avoiding dementia is a huge field of study. Avoiding injury that often comes into falls being a big impact for older adults. Maintaining physical activity, health resource utilization is just a fancy way of saying how often are these folks showing up at the emergency department or the hospital, how long are their hospital stays. And then the bubble that I spend my time in is keeping socially engaged and active, which we have seen on massive display throughout this pandemic, the impact of, of losing that, right? But what's interesting from the public health domain is that over the last 10 years or so, we've had sort of a flood of epidemiology studies that have found that age-related hearing loss has negative associations with all these different bubbles that affect whether or not we're aging well to our fullest or, or not. And so I'm not going to belabor these points, but I'm going to kind of show you the laundry list of findings where if you look across cognition and dementia, we see faster rates of decline, higher incidence of dementia in folks that have age-related hearing loss. We see an increased risk of falls. We see reduced physical mobility. Um, and other physical functioning metrics. We see increased hospitalization and we see increased social isolation, which again, is just being very amplified right now. And so we see no matter which of those age-related research bubbles you choose that hearing loss seems to come up um, as you control for all the other variables. So how much hearing loss are we talking about? Who's impacted by this? Lots, <laughs> lots of people. So this figure is showing you prevalence of hearing loss across age decade. And so you can see this age trend. So we go up in age, we go up in our prevalence of hearing loss, all the way to the point that once we're talking about folks over 70, two out of three have at least a mild amount of hearing loss. So the scope of the problem is big. We have a growing aging population and a majority of folks over 70 have at least some hearing loss. Now, a lot of them are getting by, but I will argue in the next couple slides that every little bit of hearing loss that piles on kind of affects how someone's living their life and affecting these other health outcomes. So why do we see these associations between hearing loss and cognitive and physical function. Of course, one aspect might just be the common underlying process of aging. And that has to be true, right? We're a closed system. So metabolic changes that are affecting some parts of my health are affecting all parts of my health and, and hearing loss is not immune to that. Um, but what's more interesting from a research and a practice and a public health perspective is what might be the mechanistic pathways 
that are causing the hearing loss, hearing loss to potentially accelerate these other cognitive, cognitive and physical declines. So I'll share with you one of the hypotheses that's out there right now that's sort of guiding some of the research priorities for how we address hearing loss, no longer in terms of the Thanksgiving dinner table, but in a bigger healthy aging trajectory type of approach. So one is the idea of cognitive load. This is the idea that if I have to work harder all the time just to hear, I'm using up cognitive resources that I could have been allocating to other things, like better remembering what I just heard. Um, and that has a cumulative effect over time. That was redundant. Um, it also relates to changes in brain structure and function. There's um, some epi studies that show reduced brain volume in older adults with age-related hearing loss. And there's the potential that some of that's coming from reduced sensory input, kind of reallocation of how our brain is using our neural connections. And then finally, again, my favorite bubble is the social isolation bubble. And it's not just the social emotional component of that, right? As we become more socially isolated, we also become less physically active. You used to go to bridge every Tuesday night, stop going. You stop getting ready to leave the house that day. The, all those little changes really impact how quickly somebody's um, cognitive and physical function are changing as they age. Now, those are all reasonable possible mechanisms based on research studies that are out there. What we don't know, what the big million dollar question is, um, is that the saying? I don't think that's the saying, isn't it like a $60 million question, but is what impact does intervention have on that? If these things are accelerating, or if hearing loss is accelerating the declines through any of these different pathways, can treating the hearing loss slow that down? Um, so what do we, and we don't, we don't know the answer to that. That's kind of where a big bulk of research is living right now, but what do we know about access to hearing intervention in the U.S.? <laughs> we know that it's bad. So I'm showing you the same prevalence bars, the blue bars as before. This is prevalence of hearing loss across age decade, but now in the red bars, you see prevalence of hearing aid use, and it's not even close. It's not even close, right? So um, the estimates are that about 15% of adults who might benefit from hearing aids report using them. So if intervention helps, <laughs> we're not really in a position to measure that very well because we have very few people actually accessing intervention. And the reason for that is very many things. Um, this is just a kind of cursory bubble way. The whole talk could be about the barriers to care, but um, you know, the easiest one to point to is cost. It's expensive. It is expensive. A set of hearing aids will cost you three to five thousand dollars, maybe more. It also costs you a lot of visits to a specialist, um, which has resource cost associated with it. And that is true, and it is not to be minimized. But we also know that when hearing aids are free, it doesn't solve this problem. Um, we know from European countries that their uptake of hearing aids is not tremendously more than ours. And the best numbers I've ever seen are out of a few of the Scandinavian countries and it approaches about 40% of people that might benefit, adults that might benefit have hearing aids. So we, we wildly under treat hearing loss across the world. Um, so beyond the cost, there's an access problem. There's also kind of an awareness and an understanding. When we treat it as just, well, grandpa's just annoying because he's the only one at the table that can't hear, that's different than treating it as part of your healthy lifestyle. Um, and there's also a technology problem. It's not easy. They're little, they require good dexterity. The batteries are a nightmare. Um, and it's a big adjustment process. It requires some good handholding and some good working through um, adjusting to this new technology in your life. So it's not easy. Um, and right now we have basically one way to go about it. And that limits the uptake of 
treatment. So what to do now with so much hearing loss and so little treatment? Well, on the heels of all of those epidemiology studies starting to come out in a big way, um, some high level policy actions started taking place. And I cannot believe how long ago this was now because I always give this part of the talk like it happened yesterday. But in 2015, which is now six years ago, um, President Obama had his Presidential Council of Advisors, Advisors on Science and Technology do a study and run a report on um, access to hearing aids in the US. The folklore behind it is that Michelle's mother needed hearing aids and they realized what a nightmare it was. And he was like, "This, there must be a way to make this better. I don't know if that's true, but I love the folklore aspect of it. Um, so PCAST is what you call that council. And they issued a report in October, 2015. And they said, look, there needs to be an FDA regulated class of over-the-counter hearing aids. It needs to be way more accessible because there's this 85% of the people. And if you have generic age-related hearing loss, you could have something better than nothing. And they drew parallels to having reading glasses on the counter and it caused a big stir in audiology. Um, but it went right to the FDA and they started making changes um, in how different devices are regulated and, and opened the door for this over-the-counter approach. The following year, 2016, the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine issued a much bigger report where they doubled down on everything PCAS said, but also extended the recommendations to other research priorities and um, insurance issues and all sorts of different levels. And I'll talk about that a little bit more specifically. And then the final step in this 2015, 2016, and then 2017 process is that Elizabeth Warren and Chuck Grassley introduced the over-the-counter hearing aid bill, which was signed into law. And those devices should have started to become available this year or last summer. Time is weird now with COVID. Anyway, I think the FDA got distracted. It hasn't happened yet, but it's on the cusp of there being this actual class of devices that will be available. So it really changes the way our field audiology, um, the field of care for older adults. I mean, it changes the way we think about how people will have access to technology. So just to talk about that um, National Academies report a little bit, because this was a big change, I think, for a lot of audiologists, because we're not usually trained in our clinical programs to see audiology in the context of public health. We're very diagnostic, we're very client focused, and it's a very, it's a very one on one interaction in your standard clinical life. But this report drew on experts from the CDC, Department of Defense, the VA, which is the biggest, um, what do you call it, dispenser of hearing aids in the country. Uh, FDA Hearing Loss Association for America is a consumer nonprofit organization to help people with hearing loss know how to navigate things. And of course, the NIA and NIDCD, which fund most of the hearing loss related research. And so they lay out in the report, this is not about a one person problem. This is a public health concern. Treatment is majorly underused. We need to think about it at all levels. And these, this was the model and the framework they used for talking about all of the levels that needed to be addressed. And this type of uh, framework is very familiar to a public health expert, but not very familiar to an audiologist. And so um, the way they created this report and showed all of the layers, it's not to say that an audiologist doesn't realize, well, we need workplace accommodations also for the person with hearing loss, but it's that we, don't really teach our students to kind of see the hearing loss at all levels of our public health environment, health system and health policy. And that's what this report set out to do. It created 12 recommendations that set out some research priorities, policy priorities, practice priorities, and it creates a really nice framework to now 
approach audiology for adults in that sort of public health way. I would say that audiology did this for newborn hearing screenings, which are now universal. But prior to doing that and kind of separate from doing that, we didn't have the same kind of like full universal approach to care. I think that's fair to say. So I'll dial back a little bit from that context that has been set in the last 10 years or so to, to think about age-related hearing loss differently and talk about some of the projects that I've been involved with that seek to use alternative approaches to deliver care that's not specialty-based, but that addresses hearing loss. Um, so when I first joined my postdoc, there was a student that had created this community-based program that I'll talk about a little bit because it was so novel. Um, and then that led me to the work that I do now that thinks a little bit more, not community, but, but integrated into care services people are already um, pursuing. And the last bit that I have on this slide that I'm not gonna talk about, um, but I kept it here because I think public health experts are very familiar with things like um, neighborhood navigator programs, same kind of thing where you take your all-star <laughs> hearing loss participant and you better equip them to help people navigate this process um, because hearing aids are not a one and done and then you're successful, but more of a learning and habit building. So thinking of different ways to really make that part of the care system. So the Baltimore Hears program was neat because it partnered with older adults in the community and attempted to train those older adults to be the care providers. So it took a community health worker type of model um, and said, let's sit down for one hour, maybe two, depends on the person, and talk through some different communication behaviors and use one of these devices that is over the counter, which exists, they're just not FDA regulated. Um, it's like a Bluetooth device, but it picks up the sound and you use it with your phone and, and train community members to help people use it so they can kind of be the ambassadors for the program and share their experience because they really live together in these residential communities. Um, and then we took that and we spun it off in several different directions. And so um, the memory clinic we sat down at the memory clinic and as part of their dementia care, it was sort of an added on component that they sat down with me or the geriatrician that we trained to do this one hour um, additional training to give them some tools to go home with and communicate better. Um, so we can talk about those programs more in question and answer if you're interested, but, but it was, uh, a new way of me to think about, for me to think about who can deliver care, where can it be delivered, and what very simple tools can make small differences for people, meaningful differences for people. And that work, one of the lists on here, PACE peers, translated me into these group care settings where the problems are very different than the one on one Thanksgiving table. You've got a room full of people, you've got hard services big ceilings um, and just kind of an acoustic nightmare. And it's one of those problems that everyone knows is there, but nobody knows what to do with. And so my um, grant that I work on here partners with PACE programs and tries to address these problems at a higher group level than a one-on-one -on -one level. Um, I haven't been able to be in those buildings in over a year. So we're, we're working through that, but um, one thing I want to highlight before I go away from this section is that as we, as I talk about hearing loss and how it impacts the physical and cognitive function of someone, there's also the fact that a lot of adults over 65, they don't have one thing. No one has only hearing loss. They have multiple chronic conditions. And so just a quick snapshot of that burden, um, what we have here is the blue bar is adults under 65 orange is over 65. And then we're looking at the number of multiple conditions. So they just have zero or one chronic conditions up to having six chronic conditions or more. 
And you see that as people, the older population has more and more of these chronic conditions. And so the people that come to PACE are actually nursing home eligible, but living at home. And so they've got this full menu of complications. We really need to keep each of the treatments as simple as possible so they can all support each other instead of things being too difficult to add into their care. Um, and that's the last thing I wanna talk about before I switch gears a little bit is this idea of integrated care. Um, I think we all sort of know what that means, but I don't think we all know how bad the US healthcare system is at integrated care for people with complex health needs. And so this report is from a aging institute at University of Pittsburgh. And it just like really drives home to me how important it is that things like hearing loss that are so specialty, but so prevalent need to be folded into this comprehensive care network in a way that is much more seamless than it is, else it will continue to be swept to the side because the care needs are too complex as folks are getting older and having multiple conditions. Um, so that's really where my interest in this group care and integrated care kind of takes me. Um, and I think it's important not just for hearing loss, but for all of our aging care, given that as all of our baby movers go from being 60 to 70, like they are right now, into being 70, 80, and 90, this just gets more and more complicated in really large scale numbers. Okay. I'm gonna spend the last little segment of my time talking specifically about dementia um, because it's an interest of mine, but also because when you think about age-related hearing loss in the context of public health, um, dementia gets a lot of attention because it is devastating and because it is expensive. And so the connections between hearing loss and dementia are very interesting, especially to aging researchers and aging uh, clinical providers, I think, because if there is the possibility that we could slow it down um, by treating hearing loss, that could be huge. We don't know that. That's a huge interest though right now. So I just want to sell to you for people that aren't familiar with the aging and dementia land a little bit about how truly complicated and expensive it is and how there's interest right now in taking something like hearing loss that's wildly undertreated, making sure people have treatment because it has the potential to slow something as serious as dementia. So um, this graphic is now a decade old, but the projection holds that over the next 20 or 30 years, we, they're projecting worldwide prevalence increase of dementia um, and it happening all over the world. And you see how big the wedge, part of that wedge that's low and middle income countries. So when I talk about the cost of dementia care and then you put it into health systems that you know, barely have capacity and resource, it's a big, big problem. Um, it's also a well, followed problem, I'd say right now in the um, American health context. And this story came from the New York Times. And if you start kind of noticing age-related stories, I mean, beyond the COVID land that we live in now, you'll, you'll see a lot of interest in the cost of dementia care. Um, it's interesting because it increased costs across all sorts of sectors that I think we don't necessarily assume when we say someone has dementia. And so I like this example. This graph is showing um, number of hospital stays across different disease conditions. So heart failure, stroke, cancer, things that aren't dementia related, other diseases. But the purple bar are folks that have dementia or Alzheimer's and the yellow bar are folks who do not. And so we see that folks with dementia are being hospitalized more often for other conditions. So the dementia itself complicates the care of the other conditions, um, making it, again, a very expensive prospect for the health system. 
And so will addressing hearing loss help with that a little bit? So there, there's a relationship that's not new. Um, I talked about this recent push, this last 10 years of epi studies, but this JAMA article is from 1989 and they argued an increased odds ratio um, for dementia diagnosis based on hearing loss, even while confound, um, controlling for you know, other hot ticket <laughs> confounders. So it's, so it's not new, um, but the, the sort of, maybe it's the aging population imperative that has made it a recent and important push. Um, this is a more recent paper that I put in for the public health folks, because I know you like those Kaplan Myers. Um, but this is 10 years of longitudinal data from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging. And it breaks out the increased risk of incident of dementia by degree of hearing loss. So you kind of are able to see this dose dependent effect. The worse the hearing loss, the higher your risk. Um, while controlling for age, sex, race, et cetera. Um, so so we, we've seen it in the past, we see it now, there is an increased risk for dementia. Um, the last sort of summarizing piece of evidence that I wanna show you related to that is a recent study out of Lancet in 2017 that tracked all the different risk factors um, they could find in the literature and did a meta-analysis across things. And again, hearing loss came up as a significant risk factor. And I'll put that in the context of the other, um, the other risk factors they highlighted. So we start up here at birth where it's just a genetic risk factor, education. In middle life, we see hearing loss, hypertension and obesity get identified. Um, other late life risk factors, smoking, depression, physical inactivity, social isolation, diabetes. If you've ever been told anything about dementia, you've heard a lot of those risk factors before. Um, but what this Lancet article argued was of all the risk factors for dementia, 35% of that risk is potentially modifiable. And on that modifiable list of things was hearing loss and in a big way. Um, this is the attributable risk across these different conditions. And you see hearing loss, 9%. So this says if there was no hearing loss, 9%, there would be 9% less um, cases of dementia. I think I'm saying that right. Sorry if I've twisted it around. Anyway, hearing loss, risk, significant. <laughs> Which brings us back to that initial framework of are there mechanistic things happening that are accelerating this decline? And if so, will treating it slow that and mitigate that? We don't know. We can talk about some of the studies that are looking at that during Q&A if you want. Um, but for folks that study dementia, this article was a big deal and a big hope that treating some of those things like treating hearing loss could slow that decline um, that starts in late life. Sorry, starts in middle life, but, but it allows you to maybe correct course a little bit even at these advanced stages. So that is, I think, a reasonable summary of why hearing loss, dementia, aging, and public health are very kind of tied together right now in a big important way. So moving forward from some of this context um, where we need more research to support is does treating the hearing loss slow the decline? We don't know that. Do simple solutions work? What's good enough? because that's where I like to live. <laughs> what are the little, little tiny steps we can take that result in some success? And how do we integrate these services, whether they are the gold standard or the most simple thing? I have, I have a prop. 
I mean, when I talk about simple, I'm talking about this is a microphone and you wear some headphones and you're able to play bingo now because you can hear the person, right? So I'm talking about simple, simple things that allow people to stay involved. Um, and so that's all I want to say about that. I have a couple more slides, but I think I'd rather stop. And, and have a chat and see if anybody has questions. I can go back to my, no, that's not true. I lied. <laughs> I am gonna tell you my favorite quote because at the big picture level of this, I, I am still an audiologist that likes to do hand-holding with my participants. So I'll, I will close with the like warm fuzzy quote. So this woman was part of our dementia clinic project. And the woman giving the, quote is the adult child caregiver for her mother with dementia and we gave her mother like one of these pocket talkers like I just put on my head and and a little worksheet with communication strategies and you know and spent the time talking to her like what is your goal what's hard I remember that their goal was to be able to like ask her simple things like what do you want for breakfast this morning mom do you want eggs or do you want cereal right they were at the point of writing that down and putting it up for her, which is a great communication solution, but it lacks the sort of warm, good morning, how was your sleep, right? Um, so they used this pocket talker and they started being able to have those simple exchanges and it was just game changing for them. How is that true for everyone? I'm not, I know, I'm a realist, but for some of these people, they just need a little connection again, right? So her quote was, my mother listens to music more often. And when she's watching television, she seems to understand what she is watching and laughs or smiles at appropriate times. She also speaks louder, asks more questions and seems to follow the conversation better. She is reading more often. And that's my favorite part because we should not have changed her mother's reading behaviors by giving her some better communication access, but it really bridges social isolation in more ways than telling her that she wants eggs or cereal for breakfast, right? So um, I think we can make big strides with little tiny steps, I guess, is my closing statement. And uh, we'll leave up my acknowledgements page for a minute, but if we wanna start having some Q and A instead of me talking, I would be all for that. Hi, Sarah. This is Laura Vandenberg. Hi, Laura. Um, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about what interventions have been shown to have the biggest impact because, um, you know, my this is my parents' generation, I think, right now that are starting to, you know, actually lose their hearing. And there's a lot of stigma, I think, around getting, you know, fitted for a hearing aid, wearing a hearing aid. And I'd love for you to talk about stigma also and like, how do we a, you know, go over that barrier, but, um, you know, are there non hearing aid solutions that actually can help you recover hearing or maybe retain the hearing that you still have? Yeah. So yeah. Stigma. Let's do that second. It's a big thing. Yeah. Um, so, so treatment options. I mean, the gold standard, the tried and true really is a really well fit pair of hearing aids. Um, what that entails to be done best is that it's really an ongoing process and not a one and done sort of thing, right? So it's not just the hearing test, but also a good interview about, tell me about what goes on in your life. Tell me your day to day. What are your favorite hobbies? What did you stop doing? Um, what, what are some of the goals that we need to kind of like focus on to get you back engaged in the things that were most meaningful to you, right? So that's best done with an audiologist who is going to schedule three, four, five appointments through that fitting process to kind of not just choose a good technology, but kind of craft the plan and the expectations and all of those pieces together. Um, there, the flip side of that and what the, what the over-the-counter piece offers is that for someone who's not there yet, but recognizes like, okay, I'm doing fine, except I go to this 
um, you know, library board meeting once a month and it's a nightmare. So let me just try something to get started in the process, right? So that's the kind of thing that something that's more accessible might, you might start using it with your phone and just mm -hmm. at a meeting like that. And it like lets you kind of take some steps to where you start to realize some support is good. And then the hope is once you've sort of run your course with that, you go to something that's customized to fit you and wear all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, the most, the biggest optimist in me would say just that new level of access can move us towards something that's a bit more normalized and start addressing the stigma. If my device is not really a hearing aid and it's mm -hmm. not really because I'm old and decrepit, but it connects to my phone and it maybe even monitor. I mean, like this is the future of all our wearable technology, right? Maybe it even monitors my heart rate or does this or that. Yeah. Yeah. The life device and I'm willing to wear it. Plus it gives me some of that amplification that I need. So, so that's the, the sort of the creative and hopeful thinking around that over the counter stuff is that it becomes a wearable health device that that we all do and that we're all exactly <laughs> right so so that's kind of the thought of how the over-the-counter spreads the normalization of it makes it more of a device that's integrated into other aspects of our technology which are you know the technology has been so hard for older adults but at least the lower the younger end of the boomers are quite integrated in technology too, right? They, they're they going to be able to do some of the self-fitting that people haven't necessarily been able to do in the past. So that's kind of the trajectory of how I see it being a bit of a broader, there's more things out there. Then the other thing I'll say is that the other most helpful thing that gets overlooked and downplayed, unless you're at a university setting where we have students that teach these classes, are just oral rehab group sessions where a group of community members come together and often at least one of the persons is a hearing aid user but it doesn't really have to be and, and you go through communication strategies and you share share strategies share tools share your challenges it's always that communication partner who doesn't have the hearing loss is usually pretty frustrated they find out that mm -hmm. they're not alone you know so that kind of like that group learning is very useful and just kind of also underutilized, under offered, I think, because there's not a lot of bang for the buck. So it's usually university clinics that that kind of coordinate that. But that's something that can live at senior centers and things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, hearing protection. It's always good, no matter what stage of life you're at. Even if you have hearing loss, you can lose more of it. And mm -hmm. once that damage is there, it's there. So um, so hearing protection concerts, sporting events, yard work, even vacuuming. If I do my whole house in one full go, that's a long time that the vacuum's going in my ear. Yeah, yeah. That's really great. Thank you so much, Sarah. What a great talk. Thanks. Yes, Sarah, along those lines, I was wondering to what degree are um, audiologists such as yourselves being consulted in these explosion of assisted living communities for older individuals, given the fact that there's been, you know, more of a, a push for them and more people are willing to sort of enter into those types of communities where they might not necessarily need any services, but they're planning for them in the future. Um, and I just wondered to what degree do you think you're, your expertise is actually being used and how can we push that more? Yeah, I, I saw Toma shaking her head no as you asked your question and very underutilized. And I don't know, I think both sides are likely to blame there, right? But I think the most often that an audiologist gets consulted by these big assisted living things is after They've got the whole new building built and everybody's in there and now nobody can hear in the dining hall because they've got 18 foot ceilings and then they ask the audiologist to come give them some advice and it's like well hire an acoustic engineer before you do this. Um, so, so when audiologists get called into those sites it tends to be very after the fact 
um, which, you know, maybe that that's a niche thing for some audiology student on here who wants a private practice that's different than a hearing aid practice, like specialize in <laughs> being that person that gets called during the development of this because you know, I have a big emphasis on that. Um, and so that's, that's one problem. There are things you can do to retrofit and there are um, recommendations you can make about like, um, you know, if there is an activity room or an auditorium, you can do different kinds of um, public access systems that are useful, but um, it rarely happens in advance of senior centers or assisted living facilities. Toma, yeah, chime in. I, I was just gonna say, I think it would be great to include um, more acoustic engineers or, or audiologists when they're building or devising or planning these things in the first yeah. place. Yeah, and it rarely, rarely happens. The other well, thing I would say, um, I think it's still related enough, and then is that like at the nursing home setting where it's much more of a rehab team um, and you're not dealing so much with, I mean, there's the problem of like bingo, but we're talking about even more restricted activities and things, um, audiologists are never there. They're never at the rehab table. They've crafted their profession around being diagnostic experts and providing this specialty, specialty high-end care. And they don't emphasize the side of their profession that is the rehab team where there's a speech path and a physiotherapist and an occupational therapist. And we need audiologists to want to be at that table. And we haven't been over the last 30 years. Um, and I think that hurts a lot. Now, speech pathologists are our sister profession, and they are the ones that argue on behalf of communication support and hearing loss, but it's not their main track, certainly not when you're at a nursing home setting and they're dealing with swallowing and they're dealing with Parkinson's and they're dealing, you know, so it, it, it ends up being second fiddle and sort of this leftover thing. Um, yeah, well, just remind me that, you know, I'm going to um, plug your name in because Eisenberg wants to create a certificate and a master's program, certificate of the undergrad and a master's program for um, nursing. They're not going to call it nursing home. They're going to call it, I think, assisted living management. And so they're going to start trying to train those folks. And I really think your talk is a prime, you know, or even other people doing work in this area is a prime example of how you can expose people at the beginning of their training to think about these things for when they're going into the field. Yeah. Um, I see a couple of comments. Um... Karen Helfer says, we've had very little emphasis on audiologists and public health interfacing together, which is part of why I was so happy to come here. There are, how many CONDIS programs live in public health? It's like three or six or something. Um, yeah. Um, I didn't even know there was two. Well, the dean, yeah. the former dean uh, came from South Carolina and I believe that was the only other I don't know that it might be the only other one. I feel like the other one is like Jackson State University or something. I've been like, I've been randomly contacted by one other person one time that was like, how do you fit into your public health department? I um, thought we were the only one guys. <laughs> I think Marjorie's, I think Marjorie's former. Yeah. School was another one, but I just don't know about Jackson State. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. I wanted to say. I mean, from, oh, Lisa Summer says Temple University. Is okay. Um, but yeah, it's true. I mean, we just haven't, I mean, I think aside from, I think the, the shining star of audiology in the public health domain was newborn hearing screenings where we, um, I mean, and, and that is game changing. I mean, that's entirely changed an entire generation of children born with hearing loss that and it's like 90% coverage. Follow-up is still a challenge and it varies state to state, but I mean, just a hugely successful example of broad coverage, but the, but the only one for audiology. I mean, I guess hearing conservation should be a public health and that's what the World Health Organization spends a lot of their efforts emphasizing 
is here in conservation, we have OSHA and it has its ups and downs, um, but you know, and globally, there's plenty of countries that have no occupational protection of hearing loss. And um, Karen, were you gonna chime in? Only to say that we have, I think we have, we are so uniquely poised here at UMass because we're in a school of public health to really move this forward, you know, and take the opportunity to um, change how audiologists think about this. You know, I'm, I'm on the same page as Sarah because I do similar types of research, but I think there's so much potential here. There's another chat, Sarah. Okay. I can read it to you if it's helpful. Um, oh, well. How can we, ah, how can we delay progressive hearing loss? Well, <laughs> it depends on a lot, a lot, a lot of things. Um, the main way is protecting from noise. Even if the hearing loss is not as a result of noise exposure, um, it could be a result of, of any of the other things that cause hearing loss, but still protecting from noise at every chance possible will not compound the hearing loss that's there. There certainly is a line of research about regenerating hair cells in the inner ear. Um, that has been an interest since before I was in the field. Um, I actually heard them talking about Regeneron on the radio today and their antibody. Um, and I thought, isn't Regeneron one of the companies that has a hair cell? Um, regeneration study or mechanism or medicine. But anyway, it's, it's never, it, it's yet to become a clinical reality, but there, but there certainly is a line of research that looks to actually restore um, sensory neural damage or, or loss. I mean, it, when I say damage, I don't necessarily mean from noise, but, but the only thing you can really actively do to protect is protect yourself from noise. Now there's some evidence of good metabolic health. So exercise, just like it's good for your brain, it's good for your ears because you got blood flow that um, keeps the inner hair cells in your inner ear organ healthy and active. Um, so Toma, Rich. I would also add um, a, a lot of different kinds of chemical exposures and they may also be synergistic with noise exposure. So that means people who work in paint companies or work with carpeting or, you know, a lot of those artificial vapors in addition to medications, obviously, but. I was gonna say that the, the cardiovascular part of keeping, that makes sense just logically. And the, the, the cochlea does, you know, get blood supply and it uses it to change the voltage in the inner ear. And some people think that's a big part of, of presbycusis and other people do not. So I don't think we know quite yet, but it certainly makes sense from a logical point of view, certainly in the gerbil. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you change the electrical activity in the gerbil as if, as if the cardiovascular blood supply was reduced, you create an old gerbil ears in, in a young gerbil, mm -hmm. so. The other thing that that makes me think of is I was at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference. I think that's the right series, AAIC, huge Alzheimer's based um, conference several years ago in Toronto. And I overheard these two people come out of a session and was like, I don't know if it makes me happy or sad to find out that really at the end of the day, what your mom told you was right, go outside and eat your vegetables. Like <laughs> for all of the money that goes into Alzheimer's research and we don't have a cure, but the best we could say for now is just be healthier, go for a walk and eat your vegetables. And that's kind of the best news we have for you right now. <laughs> mom knew. An apple a day keeps a doctor away. Remember that old saying? Yeah. <laughs> and the, us nutritionists would agree with that. Yeah. These ad, old adages have roots somewhere. 
Well, I think antioxidants, you know, protect against, so eating your spinach and anything you can do to, you know, be healthy and have antioxidants flowing around in your ear is going to help fight off noise-induced hearing loss, maybe. <laughs> Not proven, but it makes sense, right? And if you introduce antioxidants, you can slow down noise-induced hearing loss in the gerbil. <laughs> I think it'd be interesting. You brought that example, Sarah, of the um, the gentleman um, who has an Indian background and whether or not he was a vegetarian. But I would love to see a study done of centarians to see, you know, what was their overall sort of lifestyle patterns that we could really learn from and and be able to guide us a little bit better, right? Um, I know Britain was actually doing some of that at the University of Cambridge, but I'm not sure, you know, what's happened there. Um, they were doing it more from a perspective, believe it or not, of dissecting the brain to sort of see how healthy the brains were after the age of 100. Yeah. Yeah, there's a um, one of the video clips that I often show to students if I'm doing an aging lectures um, from the 90 plus study, which is based at UC. Riverside or Irvine, one of the Southern universe, Southern, one of the UC campuses in the Southern part of California. Um, and, and they have health records on all these folks that moved into this leisure community, like in the sixties and the ones that are still there are all in their nineties. And, and, uh, that's a really neat study. And the, the 60 minutes did a piece on it that makes it really accessible for students who have never thought about aging. And that's a cool, a cool example of what the lifestyles of people that live into this late stage live healthily into this late stage are there's also a book that i've never read but i've again seen like um it was the the, the nature of things it's a canadian show but um called the blue zones where they studied where these high populations of centena centenarians were i mean like I have an island off of Italy, like they're very pocketed places. I'll, I'll find it, I'll share it. It's, um, but yeah, same kind of thing, looking at their lifetime of diet and what they were exposed to and things is really interesting. And they're pretty isolated pockets so you can trace things about them. Yeah, Sarah, I even noticed on your slide where you were showing, I think it was instant dementia, that once you get above, I think it was 85 or 90, there was actually less. So it seems like there's this thing about these people who live, you know, who were super the oldest old, who if you get to that point, the outcomes seem to be better. Right, you might be outlasting it. Um, yeah. I, my first job out of college, I was only a few months, but I worked as a care aide in a nursing home. And the maintenance person said to me, I was thinking of you the other day and I just thought you are going to live to be really old. I'm always right about this. And I was like, why would you say that to me when I'm working in a nursing home? And I was 22 and my great grandmother lived to be 103. And I was like, that is the worst thing you could possibly say to me. <laughs> but there are, there is something in genes that keeps some people going a very long time. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for your insights. It was a wonderful presentation and discussion and we appreciate your expertise and we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks everybody. Have a good evening. <laughs>